Hydrogen is the most common element on the periodic table, and it makes up over 75% of the elements in the universe. It's also the primary ingredient in H2O, or water, the most common molecule in the universe. It's the lightest and most simple of the elements, consisting of just one proton and one electron, although sometimes it likes to pair up with a neutron or two and make some exotic compounds like heavy water. Hydrogen weighs roughly a one atomic unit and has an average boiling point of only negative 259 degrees Celsius or 14 Kelvin. While you typically find it paired up, it also comes in the form of ions, which are just a single proton fired from coronal mass ejections on the sun, or as a byproduct of acid, not that kind of acid, base reactions. It's also highly flammable and responsible for one of the deadliest airship disasters in all of history. While hydrogen has caused a lot of terrible disasters, its power is often used in rocket fuel, as it combusts very quickly and efficiently while weighing much less than oil. Due to its clean and efficient reaction with oxygen, it can also be utilized for energy capture, making it a much safer alternative to car batteries. Helium is the lightest and most common noble gas on the periodic table, which is a group on the far end that are the characteristically gaseous, light-emitting introverts of the elements. Helium consists of two electrons, filling up its first shell making it unavailable for bonding, a feature of all noble gases. Helium comes in two different forms, helium-3, which is a tritium decay product produced through nuclear fusion, and a theoretical sci-fi fuel source due to its release of energy when combined with deuterium, and helium-4, which is much more abundant and can be produced in a variety of ways, including a different kind of nuclear fusion or as a byproduct of alpha decay. Helium is colorless, odorless, and non-toxic. Its only interesting physical property is that it doesn't have any. However, it has many uses, including, well, you know. But other than that, it's also used in MRI machines, which need ridiculously cold temperatures for their superconducting magnets, and helium comes in handy due to its icy cold boiling point at 4.25 Kelvin. Deep sea divers also use it to breathe easier under pressure due to its low density and not being, you know, extremely flammable like hydrogen, which means, yes, professional divers sound like this. <laughs> Lithium is the third element on the periodic table and consists of three electrons, leaving only one in the second shell, making it very reactive and able to form ionic bonds with its halogen buddies like fluorine. It's by far the lightest metal, weighing it at only 0.5 grams per cubic centimeter. For reference, the next lightest metal, beryllium, weighs over three times as much at 1.85 grams per cubic centimeter. Due to its weight, it's often used in rechargeable lithium-ion batteries because of their need to be lightweight and pocketable, including the one in your smartphone. However, environmental and health safety concerns due to its not-so-ethical mining process and, well... <laughs> Yeah, that's in your pocket right now. It's led to talks of replacing lithium batteries with less terrible ones, but other than the Method Man album, it's got tons of other uses too, like... Grease. Beryllium is the fourth element on the periodic table, aka the first one that starts with a B nobody can ever remember. It's a silvery lightweight metal with a high melting point of over 1200 degrees Celsius, and it's basically a stronger, lighter, much more expensive, and very toxic aluminum that also apparently tastes very sweet, so much so that it used to literally be called glucinium. It's used in aerospace and military applications due to its strength and lightweight, as well as being a key component in the James Webb Space Telescope because of its high melting point. It's also very useful for x-rays because of its transparency to the frequency, although in most applications it's much less commonly used than aluminum because it costs a whopping $6,000 per kilogram compared to like 3 bucks. In fact, it's so costly to extract that only three countries produce the metal, the US, China, and Kazakhstan, and it's mostly the US. But hey, beryllium is what gives emeralds their green tint. <laughs> Boron is kinda boring. It's basically just beryllium 2.0, but it's even more toxic, and it's even more expensive. It doesn't even really have any interesting uses, like beryllium is used by NASA and aerospace engineering and all this cool stuff, but boron is used to like, treat yeast infections. And, and that's about it. Unlike most elements, almost all the boron in our universe was made in supernova explosions due to its fusion product being very reactive. Yeah, boron is so unpopular that even its most common isotope would rather be something else. It's the main ingredient in borax, you know, the household detergent you can use to make kid slime. So, that's fun. You can also use it to make cubic boron nitride, which under the right conditions can actually be harder than diamond, which I didn't even know was possible. But it's so much rarer and pricier than diamond that I couldn't even find a single place to buy it online or even know what the industrial price is, so we likely won't be seeing boron rings anytime soon. Carbon. Responsible for all that is beautiful. 
Without it, we wouldn't have life. Everything in nature is a product of carbon and oxygen interacting in complex ways to produce their chemistry of life. The elk, the animals, the grass, the ecosystems, all a culmination of the incredibly sophisticated web of interconnecting proteins and polymers made possible through carbon. Carbon dioxide is necessary for plants to grow and thrive. Trees use carbon to build up their roots and grow their leaves through the impossibly intricate and unbelievably efficient process of photosynthesis. The same trees provide nourishment and water to their inhabitants, such as insects and animals. The same trees allow the forest to remain lush and hospitable, giving shade to all the creatures. The same trees we use to build our homes and light our campfires. The same trees that burn and burn and burn, spewing out thick smoke and engulfing entire mountains in a deathly blaze, zooming all in its path as it lights up the sky in a terrifying, indescribable horror. All because of our greed and our pride intruding on lands that aren't our own, shooting its inhabitants, polluting their homes with beer cans and plastic wrappers before picking up a cigarette in a drunken manner and throwing it god knows where without even the notion to put out the fire. Fire. The same fire that forges precious minerals and diamonds beneath the earth, which we use to make jewelry to express ourselves and show our creativity as a species. Diamonds that we ornament on gorgeous golden rings that symbolically express the love and appreciation we have for the most important people in our lives. Diamonds we use to propose one of the most important questions you could ever ask someone you deeply care about, whether they will spend the rest of their life with you in dedication and loyalty. Diamonds are a symbol of love and gratitude. Diamonds that pollute the environment when mined, creating deafening noise for the inhabitants of nearby populations and ecosystems. Diamonds are mined using child labor in impoverished countries so rich western elites can profit off their demise with no negative feedback because nobody cares enough to do anything about it. Diamonds that do nothing but put money in the pockets of greedy corporations extorting the poor out of whatever little they have left to make the already rich, snobby hypocrites in the top 1% who got where they are today by pure luck and being born into wealthy families propped up by a never-ending cycle of bleeding the poverty-stricken dry until they have nothing left to live. Diamonds that we ascribe so much value to because they look pretty that the starved, war-hungry nations in Africa will stop at nothing to gain control of that vast pool of wealth so they can feed their children, all while the Wall Street swindlers of our capitalist system profit in the background with no consequences for their actions because they own the government through lobbying and bribes. Diamonds made out of carbon. Do you know that diamonds can be lit on fire? Fire. The same fire we use to heat our homes. The fire where we hang our stockings on Christmas as we sit around the tree telling stories and enjoying company, showing our appreciation through gifts. The fire that powers our electric grid is the sole reason we have the privileges today that people couldn't dream of mere centuries ago. Without it, society as we know it would collapse. The fire that combusts in our vehicles, allowing us to explore and spread ideas faster than ever before, venturing to new horizons and exploring different cultures to discover who we are and what we're meant to do. Cars powered by carbon. Carbon that pollutes our atmosphere, killing birds and suffocating our own kind out of selfishness and denial. Carbon that creates a visible, everlasting impact on our planet, as the temperatures soar to levels never seen by human eyes, as the sea levels rise and natural disasters become more and more serious while oil lobbyists and corporations like Exxon and Shell tell us there's nothing to worry about. That whole climate change thing is a hoax used to sell solar panels. Don't feel bad about that F-350 gas chugger you drive to work every day. Climate change isn't real. As we fight the battle against individual carbon footprints, we fail to see it's all just a distraction from the war playing out across the world. We're just 100 companies are responsible for over 70% of carbon emissions. If we don't act soon and fight back, we might not have anything left to fight for.
Nitrogen is the seventh element on the periodic table and, believe it or not, by far the most common element in our atmosphere, making up over 70% of the stuff we breathe. It's got five electrons in its valence shell, which allows it to form super strong triple bonds like cyanide and N2, which is the stuff in our atmosphere. In fact, these bonds are so strong that plants can only get nitrogen in the form of ammonia, which has much weaker single hydrogen bonds, and the only way ammonia forms in nature is through lightning strikes vaporizing into in the atmosphere, which you can imagine isn't very common. Luckily, there is a kind of bacteria that somehow figured out how to do it with an enzyme, but this enzyme is so ridiculously complicated and not even really that efficient that we instead use the Haber-Bosch process to manufacture ammonia on an industrial scale. It's basically nuclear fusion, but with ammonia. This process alone is so terrible that it uses up over 1% of the entire world's energy, but without it we wouldn't have food, so there's a Nobel Prize waiting for anyone that can discover a more efficient process. Oh, and it can also be used to cool superconductors. Oxygen is, you know, the stuff that we breathe, and without it we would all die, so it's pretty important. Interesting enough, it's the third most common element. I expected the pattern to continue after hydrogen and helium, with lithium being the third most common, but instead it skips like five of them before jumping back to carbon and being quirky. It's easily the most common element in the Earth's crust at over 40%, and can I just say, my god is this a beautiful infographic. Thank you, elements. Visualcapulus.com. I just wish it was 16 by 9. The reason oxygen is so common is because it really, really, really likes to form compounds. I mean, you give it an iron, iron oxide. You give it a carbon, and bam, carbon monoxide. Don't breathe that. Nothing is safe from oxygen. Not even itself. Oxygen is more basic than a pumpkin spice latte because of its unique configuration, allowing it to join up with two hydrogens because of the six electrons in its valence shell that want to be eight because neon is cooler. Liquid oxygen is also magnetic, which is pretty weird to think about and gives me existential dread. Fluorine is the ninth element on the periodic table and our first halogen! Unless you count hydrogen, but most people don't know where to put that, so I'm just gonna give this one to fluorine. Halogens are the far right group on the periodic table and easily the most reactive because they're only one electron away from being in a stable configuration like the noble gases. Fluorine is so reactive that it's often used in glass etching and it's the main ingredient in hydrofluoric acid, which is the stuff they used in Breaking Bad, which makes it really good for your teeth. This is because it replaces the hydroxyl ion or something? I don't know, I'm not a dentist, but it's very important. Fluorine is also used to make CFCs, which, if you don't remember, are the stuff that almost burned a hole through our ozone layer and will still be recovering from it until 2066. Uh, and it's used in Teflon, which is very toxic and has led to a lot of accidental death and cancer. I can see why people are afraid of it. But no matter what the brainworm man says, it's very safe and does not, in fact. Turn the friggin' frog gay! Do you understand that? Turn the friggin' frog gay! Serious crap! Sodium is the 11th element and the leading cause of preventable death worldwide, killing more than every single infectious disease combined. Salt is actually pretty good for you and a rather important mineral for bodily function. However, Americans eat... My god, is that a lot. How are there not more deaths? This is insane. The reason it's such a problem is because in its consumable form, sodium chloride or table salt, it's very water soluble, meaning it attracts water, meaning it attracts water into your bloodstream, increasing blood pressure, which can cause strokes and heart attacks and all that good stuff. But hey, it tastes pretty good. Magnesium has a lot of similar properties to our friend beryllium. It's a lightweight, squishy, reactive, and toxic metal. This is because they both sit in the same group as alkaline earth metals, with two electrons occupying their valence shell which gives them their unique properties. Unrelated tangent, but while I was researching magnesium, I came across this article that says magnesium makes up over 13% of earth's total mass, and I thought, huh, that's cool. But then it claims that that's the same as Mars, and that makes absolutely no sense. But I looked it up and yeah, Mars weighs 10 times less than earth. I'm so used to thinking they're basically the same, but Mars is actually tiny compared to our planet. Uh, anyways, where was I? Oh yeah, magnesium is super important for bodily functions because it's a key component in a lot of enzymes our cell uses to carry out reactions. The main one being this guy, hexokinase, which is the enzyme responsible for the phosphorylation of glucose during glycolysis. If you have no idea what any of those words mean, don't worry, because neither do I. All you need to know is it's important.
Silicon is the 14th element on the periodic table, and if you notice, it's got the same Goldilocks number of electrons that carbon has. For this reason, some speculate that silicon-based life would be possible, since it can form the same complex structures that carbon can. It also helps that silicon is significantly more abundant on our planet than carbon, and there's no reason to think it would be different on others. While carbon-based life breathes in carbon dioxide, taking the carbon in for growth and releasing the oxygen, you'd expect silicon-based life to do the same thing, breathing silicon dioxide. Silicon dioxide is sand, so be thankful that you're carbon-based. Silicon, like boron, is a metalloid, meaning it exhibits properties of both metals and non-metals. Silicon is also a semiconductor, meaning it's somewhere between a conductor and a resistor, making it super useful for transistors, which is why it's used in computers. While there are other semiconductors, silicon is dirt cheap, and who doesn't love a dirt cheap transistor? 